This is Hannibal here from thehannibaltv.com, and we are live with a guy that uh, I've had a bunch of requests for over the years, none other than the Brooklyn brawler, Steve Lombardi, who was with the WWE for over 30 years. How are you doing today, sir? Doing great. It's actually 32 years. 32, 32 years. years. I think wow. I'm the long, longest reigning wrestler ever in WWE history. Well, let's start it off. You're you're known as the Brooklyn Brawler. Are you actually from Brooklyn? Can you tell I'm, us a bit about your childhood? Okay, I'm from Brooklyn. I grew up in uh, Bensonhurst. I had I had wrestling only on Spanish TV, Lucha Libre. All the commentation was in Spanish. But me and my brothers were into bodybuilding. So what we were looking for is like emulating the bodybuilders' bodies. I like Bruno Sammartino. So I worked chest real hard. My brother liked Billy Graham, so he blew his arms up like a balloon. You know what I mean? And then it was, it was. I just fell into it because I went. I was gonna. I was in uh, school. Then I went, I went. I went to college for two years. I was gonna be a medical technologist. Some guy gives me tickets to Madison Square Garden. He says to me, uh, "Do you want to go to the show?" Here's six tickets. So I look at the guys that I was working with. I said, hey, do you want to go? We'll go check it out. We've never been there. Let's let's do it, this and that. So I, we go to Madison Square Garden. We sit, we sit, we're we sitting there. We got great fucking seats, great, great seats. The guy next to me goes, you know, I could tell you've never been to a wrestling match before because your excitement and your intrigue about what's going on in the ring. I said, it's so cool. I mean, I really, really dig it. He says, you can meet these guys personally. I said, how the hell am I going to do that? He goes, he goes, there's a bar about four blocks from here. He goes, it's called the Savoy. He goes, if you wait after the show and you go there about an hour later or a half hour later, you you could meet, you'll go in there, all the wrestlers will be in there. So I, I looked at my friends and they all said, sure, let's go for it. Let's do it. So we did it. We took our time. We walked to the, we, we walked all the way to the foyer. It was only four short blocks. To, so I see it from a distance in the middle of the block. A wrestler comes out, which I'm not going to mention his name, and he's pissing on the street in the open. So I said, "This is going to be a rowdy fucking deal, man." So I walk into the um, I walk into the Savoy with my friends. They scatter. They all get drinks and this and that. And me, I'm getting talkative with all the wrestlers. So I walk up to Mr. Fuji. I say, Mr. Fuji, I never, uh, I never been to a wrestling match before. I says, I really enjoyed it. I think it's great. He goes, Can't you see I'm talking to Arnold Scolin? You interrupt us. I said, Oh, here we go. Strike, fuck, strike one, strike one. So I, I go sit at the bar next to Jimmy Schnooker. I, I'm, I order a drink. I said, Jimmy, I think, I think in my, I got, I feel it in my heart that I want to do this. And Jimmy just turned to me and he said, Brother. If you know, if you want this with all your heart, you can do it. You can do it. If you love it, you can do it. I believe in you, brother. Exact words. Little did I know, I kept coming back, coming back. Then now I'm buying tickets. I'm coming. I'm coming back, and I'm bugging the guys, and bugging the guys, and bugging the guys, and bugging the guys, and they're talking in carny about me. You know what I mean? This, this Kiyazai is a Miyazark, and he's, he, he comes in every Miyazark. I mean, you know Carney, right, Hannibal? Yes, I do, but I was never... It was pretty much gone by the time I got into it. The kayfabe bid finished. Yeah, so Arnold Scholar goes to me, uh, Hey, kid, you want to go to... Uh, you want to be a... No, he goes to Mr. Fuji and, and, and Carney. He goes, do you want he, he, he wants to be a wrestler, this kid. He wants to be a wrestler. They all, and Fuji's laughing, hey, 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 you know the way he is, he was. And, and they, he says, show up in Shirley, Long Island, and come down to Shirley, Long Island and uh, for a house show. They threw me in the ring with uh, S.D. Jones. I get in the ring with S.D. Jones. I had no tights, no boots, no nothing. S.D. Jones lent me his tights and boots. He actually gave them to me. He lent them to me, then he said, keep them. And I, I wore them, I got in the ring, and I was green as grass. I mean, I didn't know what the hell to do. So it was the first time I ever got in the ring. But before that, I got there early, and Skolin says, hey, kid, get in the ring. 
and then he goes he goes to uh, Snooker, Ray Stevens, and uh, Mr. Fuji, and Carney go in the ring. He goes run to each one of those guys and let them slam you. I took like 15 slams in a row. And they're all looking at me. All the boys are around the ring and they're all laughing because they know they're fucking blowing me up and they're, they're killing me. You know what I mean? Because when you don't take a slam and you take 15 slams in a row, you know, you, that hurts. So they, they all leave the ring. I go to get out. Skull goes, not you. Mr. Saito. Carney again. Going to the ring. Saito comes in the ring. He, he grabs me with a belly to belly. Boom. Locks one arm. To, takes me over. Boom. He says to Skolin, heavy. And I'm like, oh, yeah, man. I've been working out. I feel great. I didn't realize that was a negative term. I thought he was saying that I was I was heavy. I was big. I was big enough. But I realize now that it was a it was a knock on. I didn't, I didn't get up. I didn't get up good, easy. You know what I mean? But uh, it was a hell of a story. It's like a storybook of my life that came true. Because me and my brothers are in the, in, the, in the backyard as little kids looking at old wrestling magazines, saying, look at the size of Billy Graham's arms, look at the size of this, Chief J. Strongbow, this one, this one, this one. Not realizing I will wrestle every single one of those guys in the end of their career. I wrestled Bruno San Martino's last match ever. Because Vince said to him, Bruno, I want you to be in the WWF Hall of Fame. I, I know, the WWF uh, most valuable player. He goes, go in the ring one more time. He goes, Vince, only if you put me with Brooklyn Brawler. Because he's safe, he's trustable, and he's not greedy in the ring. And he told me that story every time we went to autograph sessions. And then... I, I started going to TVs, hanging around, hanging around, hanging around, hanging around. So then they started throwing me into TVs. We were doing three weeks in one day. So it was in Allentown, Pennsylvania and Reading, Pennsylvania. So it was just beating the shit out of me. I'm doing I'm doing jobs, squash jobs, squash jobs, squash jobs, squash jobs. And it's, it's every week, every week, the people in Ag Hall are saying, this is the toughest son of a bitch in the world because he just got, he just worked with Piper, got beat. He just took the Iron Sheik's camel clutch. He just took it, wrestled this guy, and he keeps coming out fresh as a daisy. So in Ag Hall, they think I'm Superman. But on TV, it's we it's weekly, so they see it differently. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, do you think that WWE should bring back those enhancement matches that they used to have because it kind of helped get the finishing moves over as well as the wrestlers over? Yes. I think that the the formula they used where it was top guy against enhancement guy w worked better because you would have to pay to see top guy against top guy. Now they're doing it like top guy, top guy, top guy, top guy, top guy, top guy. And, and it's everything's, everything's a competitive match. There should be, you got to build the top guy and then put the top guy against the top guy. And then what, what, what broke my stride was Ricky uh, Ricky Steamboat, who I had his first match when he came to WWF, and I was booked against him. I want to be Mr. Steamboat. I'm wrestling you today. He goes, "Okay, no problem. I just want you to know one thing. I don't beat a dish rag." I said, "Yes, sir. Anything you want. Anything you want." Takes me in the ring. He makes me look like a million bucks. Double leapfrog, stop him, clothesline him, beat the shit out of him, throw him in, give him an elbow. He's selling for me. He's doing everything for me. All the boys are looking at the screen like, holy shit, look at Lombardi. He's, he's actually having a competitive match with Ricky Steamboat. And then after that, it started following suit where they would all give me more offense. So you were actually trained by WWE wrestlers you didn't go to a regular school or anything? You were just trained before the shows and stuff like that? I was trained in the shows. I was trained in the show. Well, aside from the Arnold School and with the slams and all that kind of stuff, that's not training. That's abuse. But uh, I, I, I learned on the job, doing it over and over and over. I was, I, was, I was working every TV, every TV, every TV, every TV, until finally the first booking sheet came out. And then my name started to become on the booking sheet. I said, wow, I'm actually on the booking sheet. And at that time, 
I was I was working in a, a supermarket as a as a dairy manager, and I told them, I, I I called my manager up and I said I broke my leg. I said I can't come. They said okay, we'll give you disability and uh, just heal up, get better, this and that. I said great. Now I can wrestle full time. I could go on the road. I could do my whole my whole thing. So then about three or four months pass. The phone rings. It's the manager at a supermarket. He goes, just checking up on you. How you doing? I says, <clears throat> I'm coming along. He says, I could see that when you were in the camel clutch on television. He goes, I respectfully tell you, you are fired. I didn't care. I, I wanted to wrestle. So I got out of there and I just got on the road and I did, I did everything I had to do. And <clears throat> I'm actually doing a seminar next week. And I'm going to talk to a bunch of kids about what to do and what not to do and what not to refuse. You know what I mean? <clears throat> I, I think the, the reason for my success, which I consider success being, uh, being, being longevity was to do anything they asked me to do as far as jobs, I mean, I even got beat by a girl once. I, I wrestled a midget. Uh, well, I don't know if you, you can say midget anymore. Little man. Little man with the macho man face on. So, Oh, yeah, man. Tiger Jackson. What was his name? Tiger Jackson. Yeah, Tiger Jackson. You got yeah. it. You got it. He was dig too, wasn't he? Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. Yeah. yeah you were and also I doink. Uh, you I know, you doink. had so many different gimmicks. Check this out. I'm sitting at home. I'm washing my car in my driveway. My, my wife calls me. She goes, Vince McMahon's on the phone. I go, you're kidding me. I, I get on the phone. I go, Vince. He goes, Steve, I got something for you to do. I go, anything you need, Vince. He goes, I know that's right. I go, he goes, I need you to fly to Calgary and wrestle Bret Hart for the WWF World Heavyweight Championship. I said, no problem. I wrestled Bret a lot of times. He goes, as doink i said vince the problem is the paint job i said i never did a paint job on my face like that i said i'll be happy to do it he goes i knew you were gonna say that what we're gonna do is we're gonna fly you from your house where i was living in, in michigan to uh cleveland where matt Bourne was living and his wife is gonna have the doink suit in the in the uh baggage claim she's gonna hand it to you then you're going to jump on a plane and come to Stanford. Then you're going to meet this girl. Her name was Jill. She was the makeup artist. She's going to show you how to do it and how to do, and give you a diagram and give you all the paint and all the things you need to do. Then we're going to put you on a plane and send you to Calgary. Now, at that time, uh, Doink was the hottest heel in the territory. So I get to Calgary. The paint job, I, I took my time. I had a fan. I was doing nice, but... It's hard to do a paint job with Kurt Hennings walking over to you and pushing your arm, trying to mess you up. You know what I mean? It was a big rib. Everything was a rib. But it was so funny to go from, oh, the book of ball, I'm going to kick your ass to. Do, 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 do. I mean, it's like a complete, a complete opposite. So when I walked through the curtain, I was a top heel in one day. So Bret Hart worked, Bret Hart worked with me who I also had Bret Hart's first match in WWF. I had Rock's first match in WWF. I had Rock Henry's first match in WWF. I, they would give me all the first matches with everything. But anyway, after I was doink, they sent me to Europe as doink. They sent me all over the place as doink. I was doing doink, 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 doink. That's when Bam Bam had a friend, which he politic Vince, and said, uh, make, 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 make my friend uh, doink the clown, you know? Lombardi's in England, you know, and I forget his friend's name. It was, uh, it was a friend of Bam Bam. It wasn't Ray, Ray Apollo. It was the guy guy before that. But uh, they made him doink. I felt fucking pissed off because I said I put my heart and soul in this. And I was tearing the house down with X-Pac because I worked with X-Pac every day. And I was, and I was, uh, I was just, I was just doing great. And I came back and I figured I had this thing clinched. You know, and then they had to replace. And oh no, no, then they sent me to Memphis. Then I worked. Then I was working in, in Memphis for Lawler. And then uh, uh, Lawler says, "Do you hear they got a new doink in New York?" I says, "What are you talking about?" He goes, "Yeah, Bam Bam's friend. They made him doink." I says, 
but what I got, I'm doing now. And he goes, he goes, well, that's what they did. So I went back and uh, I back back to uh, Brooklyn Brawler. Brooklyn Brawler was cool, but I I, I love Brooklyn Brawler. But people thought I was getting beat legitimately when half the guys that I was fighting, I could beat up in the dressing room. You know what I mean? But now they realize, finally, these days, they realize I was making them look good. It's, it's got nothing to do with getting beat up. I hid their weaknesses and I accentuated their strengths. Like I wouldn't tell Mark Henry to jump off the top rope. You know what I mean? But if I worked with Marty Gennetti and uh, and Shawn Michaels, I would, we would do everything. You know what I mean? So it was, it was, I adjusted to every situation put in front of me. Why was Matt Bourne replaced as Doink? And do you have any stories about Matt Bourne? He's a popular subject on this channel. <laughs> Matt Bourne was, I think, was the best Doink, to be honest with you. But he, he had a few demons. But uh, he got suspended for some reason. I don't know the exact reason, but he was suspended. And that's how it, it fell on me. That's how it fell on me. And then all the gimmicks started falling on me. Then I get this thing in my head. Do you remember the movie The Warriors? Yeah, that's a great movie. Remember the baseball players? Yeah. Okay, so I see uh I see the baseball player game. I'm like, wow, that's cool as shit. But so later on in life, Damien Demento, he was a great artist. I said, Damien, I said, draw me a picture of a face with a baseball like, as a baseball player. And he did it, and he did it really good too. He just drew a, a, a just a head with the baseball face. I knocked on Vince's door. I said, "Vince, I have an idea," and he he, he was receptive. I put it down. He looks at it. He tilts his glasses to his nose. He goes, "Interesting. I'll give it some thought." I said, "I just want you to know, Vince, it's never been done." And then he said, "Really?" And after I said that, it got done. But Doink the Clown is my most signed picture. I mean, would you know what it's like to write Abe Knuckleball Swartz 15, 20 times? It's, it's insane. I can imagine one question about the Ace Knuckleball Shorts. It started off as MVP and you were in the crowd because of the strike. Yeah, it seemed strike. like there was like a three-month buildup of that. And then they only let you do the gimmick for like a month or so. Yeah, Vince came up to me one day and he goes... I got too much uh, of face paint in the company. I have Doink, I have you, and I have uh, Gold Dust or wherever. He goes, and I was a joke. I just said, get rid of Doink. You know, and then they, they faded it out, but they still used it on the side on house shows and all that. But uh, it was a cool gimmick. I mean, people love it. I'm still signing that. I want, I'm going to do, I want to do a, 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 so, a thing as as Abe Knuckleball Swartz at a convention and do pitches with them. I think it'll do well. There's a fan here that says he saw you wrestle as Knuckleball Schwartz in Boston and everyone was chanting brawler. Was that normally happening that people recognized you? Yeah, but they usually get caught with, caught up with the with the story and everything. It didn't happen to that extent. I've heard a couple of brawlers out there even even as doink you know you, you'll always hear that the smart marks you know they, they think they know everything but uh i wasn't concerned with it i was concerned about doing the best i could do with the gimmick they give me yeah they gave you a lot of gimmicks you were also kim she for kim kamala she. how did you like it, that it was good but it was like babysitting it was like babysitting what people don't realize is, you know, like we would do the Ugandan, uga, uga, la, 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 uga, la, uga. then he would walk over to me and he would go, Kim Chi, I don't forgot everything I'm supposed to do. And I say, James, he's going to go for hit you with the tackle. He's going to take the bump. You go for the elbow. He moves. He goes, got it. I said, ba, la, uga, la, uga. And then we go back into, the, into, into that. But that's the way it really was. I did that for about six years. Oh really? You you did it even when he was a heel then back. Yeah, then. yeah. I was I was the only Kim Chi. There was Friday before that. That was before my time. Who played Friday? 
of different people. Or? No, one guy. Uh, was it Frank Dalton? Is that possible? I think that might be the name, but I'm not sure. It was before my time. But uh, James was a very hard guy to travel with, and he he lied a lot. He lied a lot. Like he says, oh, oh Undertaker got 15, 150000 for WrestleMania, and I got 15000 which is a complete bullshit story because Harvey used to cash all his checks because he used, he used to never pay taxes. He used to burn his house down when tax time came, said his ta- all his papers. So Harvey says, said, told me, he said, this day I should have photostatted every one of those. The guy was making twenty to 30000 a week consistently. How was your pay over the years as far as what would have been your best years uh, making money? Did you make more behind the scenes or was it when you were in front of the camera? When I was in front of the camera, when I first started, I think my first year I made 83 grand. I, I averaged, I averaged between 150 and 200 every year. I, when I, when a, a company went public, they put us under contracts and they tried to drop my salary. So, I went up to Vince. I said, Vince, this, this is way too low. I go, this is like poverty. He goes, poverty, what a word to say. I said, Vince, when you think about a mortgage, house payments, this, that, I'm going to have to sell my house. He goes, well, call my assistant tomorrow and remind him of this conversation. Now I said, I'm either fucked or he's going to help me. I called his assistant. Next TV, I go to TV. John Laurinaitis calls me to the side. He says, Vince just bumped your salary way up. I said, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, he did me right. He did me right. Michael Collins wants to know, you did have title matches against HBK in 92, then one against Triple H on SmackDown in 2000. How did you like getting those random main event roles? It's very interesting. The one in Madison Square Garden against Shawn Michaels was the first day of DX. So so China and Hunter were on the outside. This is how it happened. There was a battle royal two months before I had that match. Ken Shamrock was supposed to go over. He hurt his sternum. He like cracked his sternum in his chest. And uh, all the agents and I walked in Vince's room too. And he said, uh, they said, Ken Shamrock can't go over because he's hurt. Vince looked up and he said, put over Brook and Brawler. He's local, forgetting that he advertised the winner of the Battle Royal wrestles the World Heavyweight Championship in the next Garden show. So I just said, yes, sir, anything you want. I won the ring. Everybody was bumping for me. I won the Battle Royal in Madison Square Garden. I come back. All the agents, was not a call and producers, all the agents said, you're never going to get that match. There's no way in a million years Vince is going to go for it. So I knock on Vince's door. I say, Vince, I I didn't realize this. You advertise the winner of this match wrestles the World Heavyweight Championship in the next Garden show, which was uh, Bret Hart. He looked at me and he goes, you got your match. I mean, in that with that intensity. With that intensity, so now there's a now there's a month gap in between the two garden shows, which was the Montreal screw job. Now, Shawn Michaels is the champ now. I'm still scheduled to wrestle the World Heavyweight Championship. Now, Shawn Michaels, I love him to death, but back then he was a he was a wise guy. He was it, you know, he was a different person. He was a very a different person than he is today. And I, I was afraid that he wouldn't do it. So we're all, we're all sitting at the bar and with Arnold Skoll and a bunch of wrestlers and Skoll and goes, and uh, Sean was in there. He goes, hey, Sean, you know who you're working with in the garden? He goes, who? And he goes, this guy right here. And he points to me. I said, I'm dead now. That's it. He's going to fucking curse me out and everything. And it's not. He goes, oh, my God, could you leapfrog? Could you do a super kick? Could you do this? Could you do that? He was so into it, it was freaking me out. And he gave me the match of my life, and he kicked out. If you ever find that match, he kicked out on two and a half every time. The whole garden was erupting. They thought they were going to drop the belt to me. 
and Hunter, Hunter would go to, on, on the apron. I would pop Hunter. China would come in. She, uh, I, I, that, those days, you could hit a girl. I nailed, I nailed China, and then before you know, he he went over, but it looked he gave me eighty percent of the match. As far as how the wrestlers uh, treated you, I've always heard that some could be very uh, careless with enhancement talent. Others respected you like uh, Steamboat and Flair and all them. You weren't really enhancement talent because you were regular, but who were some of the guys that treated you well and were there any that treated you like crap in the ring? I don't think anybody treated me like crap in the ring. I think other some people were stiffer than other people. Like Bret Hart was snug. He kicks you in the stomach. He's kicking you in the stomach. But then again, when you work with Shawn Michaels, he's like a feather. You know, you work at Undertaker, he's like a feather. But other people like to be snug. But actually, Shawn Michaels' kicks look better than the than the shoot the shoot kicks. So nobody abused me. I, other talent would only get abused if they screw up a spot, if they take a shitty bump. Because if you take a shitty bump, you're making the guy giving you the bump look like shit. So that's where that abuse thing comes in. There wasn't no deliberate abuse. Now, I, I remember seeing you at house shows in the late 80s and early 90s. Were you regularly on the house shows every week? Or was it more when somebody couldn't show up or got fired or something, you would take their place? Well, when I first started, they said, if, some, if someone... If someone uh, doesn't show up, you could we work and you get paid. If everyone shows up, you don't get paid. But in those days, it was Snooker Morocco, this guy, that guy. And it was always somebody missing. So I more, more or less always worked. And it evolved into full time. And I worked 17 days a month for 17 years. I remember you against the Predator at the Ottawa Civic Center uh, at a house show in particular. Who was the Predator again? I have no idea. Some the Predator. What, did, what was his gimmick? I, can't, I remember the name. I just don't remember the gimmick. I think he was a guy that they never really did anything with. He had like a mask and, and blonde hair. And you were brought in as the enhancement guy for that show, but... But everybody uh, was cheering you in that match because they didn't know who he was. Yeah, because I was on TV every week, and he's a new guy. And that happens today too. Yeah, if, if, if you throw a guy nobody ever seen in the ring, like when I wrestled Rock's first match, you know he, he's never. Did you see Young Rock? You, you ever do watch that show at all? I didn't see it, but let's get into that now. Your relationship with the Rock. Okay, I had the Rock's first match ever not just in wwf ever in front of an audience so rock's got a show now called young rock on nbc and on uh it's season two episode eight it's called corpus christi they got colt cabana playing me and they made him grow a beard i mean you would swear it was me he got they got the gimmick down perfectly he did a great job and uh and, and they had an act playing me, or rock, and they called play, playing me, and they tell the whole story. And Rock says, Steve Lombardi is my opponent tonight. He's doing this, he's breaking me in just the way he broke my dad in. Because Rocky Johnson, when he first came into WWF, I had his first match too. I was the first match guy, ultimate warrior, first match guy. If they don't kill Lombardi, we'll, keep, we'll, go, we'll keep going with him. Now, you had a lot of matches against the Ultimate Warrior. How was your experience working with him? I worked with him 47 consecutive days in a row. He, he accidentally knocked me out twice. He was – no people didn't like him because he would come in the dressing room and he'd go, fuck, I just seen you yesterday. I'm going to shake your hand again. What do we do? Shake hands every day we see each other. You know, but he liked me. He liked me. But then he turned – the company turned on him. I was worked at, then I was going, I was moving into running the pre-tape room, which is the interview room. They told me to produce a, a video knocking the ultimate warrior. The ultimate warrior uh, left the company, bad terms, didn't speak, hated Vince, hated everybody, hated that, hated this. Then they make men's. 
I, I was the only one. I put myself on all the all the videos because I would sit in the chair, ask, say the question out loud, and then I would answer my own question. But when I walked into the the Hall of Fame, because they decided to put Ultimate Warrior in the Hall of Fame, I walked into his dressing room. He started crying. He said, I was just thinking about you. He goes, when I put out that bullshit interview, he says, you were the only one that talked good about me. I said, Jim, I always respected you. He goes, well, you better be prepared to stand up tonight because I'm going to tell the story how you took me in the other room and smartened me up and told me to say nothing and say, yes, whatever you want me to do. I said, Jim, please don't do that because I'm still working for the company and they're going to think that I'm a stooge. They can't tell me nothing. He goes, fuck, fuck, it was 30 years ago. I said, Jim, please don't say that. He goes, okay, I won't say that, but stand, you're going to get, you're going to stand up anyway. And when I, when I, when he says, where's Steve Lombardi stand up, he goes, Steve took a lot of my abuse and he always kept a good attitude about it. That's uh pretty interesting. Good that you uh, stood up for your friend. Vic says that uh, Horace Hogan was the predator. Okay. Do you remember Horace, that? Whole Horace Hogan. I remember Horace Hogan. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Apparently they tried to give him a job or something. Yeah. Well, you don't get given a job. You create a job. You you make your own breaks. The brother man says, what do you think about the future of pro wrestling? And what advice would you give for future wrestlers? Well, I'm going to do a seminar next week. And I'm not even going to rehearse. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to tell my life story and what I did. All I can tell them is what I did and what gave me my success. Future wrestlers, what I would tell them is, if you're doing it for the money, forget about it. If you're doing it for the love of the business, you got a chance. And whatever they ask you to do, just do it. Don't say why. Don't say no. Don't say but, but, but. The word but is like a negative word. Just do it. And that's what I did. One one time, uh, oh, I told you I told you about uh, Tiger tiger a little little tiger yeah be, get, get him beat by the midget yeah vince walks in the, into the dressing rooms i need somebody to put over tiger all the wrestlers put their head straight down i raised my hand why why would you put your head down showing vince i will not do what you want to be done and i'm the only one that says i'll do it i mean it, it works in any job it works in any job. And and then, well, the funny thing about it is people get mad. Like if you talk to certain wrestlers and you say job, they get pissed. I don't. Because when you talk about a jobber, anyone who has a job is, is a jobber. You're a jobber right now interviewing me. And the person who your boss is is a jobbie. I mean, what, where did this job work thing get so offensive? I don't get it. Yeah, like the people that get beat up in movies, they're not looked down upon. But in wrestling, it's different for some reason. But it's a job. It's that's not, all that is. Not anymore. Not anymore. They flew an entire crew down to, to my, uh, not my house, a hotel, a really ritzy hotel. And they were, they were doing they did stories on the, uh, they talked to me for about two hours on, they were calling me an architect of wrestling, that I would put the match together. And I knew it because, like, like when Mark Henry walked in the dressing room, I said, "This guy's the strongest man in the world." I says, "Power spots, push offs, go through the ropes. You know, let him push me right through the ropes. You know, let him press me over his head. You know, it, it, it was like it was like a, it was like almost a, a a content. Like, can I do this? Can I get this guy over? Once in a while, I would get like a bodybuilder or." A, you know, like a, an athlete, like a football player, and they would move like robots, and I just couldn't do it. I just, it, it just it didn't look good. It didn't look good. I always uh, heard that Ahmed Johnson was very dangerous in there. Did you ever get in the ring with him? Yeah, if he, Ahmed Johnson, he's one who had all that uh, oil put in his triceps and all that shit. Uh, I was in the ring with him many times. He wasn't dangerous with me. Nobody was dangerous with me. And as far as when you became the Brooklyn Brawler, they gave you a push, and you were even in WrestleMania. Bobby Heenan was managing you. 
How did that happen where you went from just being Steve Lombardi to the Brooklyn Brawler? How much input did you have on that character? And why didn't they continue with the push? It seemed to be short-lived. Well, I was becoming I was becoming the most well-known uh, enhancement talent on TV because I was always there every week. I was on TV more than the top guys because I was wrestling every hour on those three-hour sessions. So one day, Bobby Heaney comes up to me and he goes, you know, kid, you learned how to wrestle now. Now we're going to teach you how to make, make money. I'm going to put you in my family. He goes, I need somebody to work with Terry Taylor, Red Rooster. And that, that's how that all became. He goes, I want you to wear jeans. I want you to be scruffy. I want you to be dirty. I want you to wear a Yankee shirt. Because back then, everybody liked the Mets. They didn't like the Yankees. He goes, wait, wear a Yankee shirt. He goes, and I will come to the ring with you every time. And then all of a sudden, I go from losing to winning every night. Winning, 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 winning. And even even made the WrestleMania five, you know, with uh, Bobby Heenan. And I was in a couple of WrestleManias that people don't even know as different characters. But um, it's funny the way people think it is. It isn't. It isn't. I, I can't wait to do the seminar because the last one I did, people were freaking out. They were freaking out. Any stories about Bobby Heenan? One, probably the greatest manager in my opinion of all time. Bobby was the wittiest, funniest, nicest guy I, I, I ever met. He was, I mean, he, he he was teaching me the business. He was teaching me how to get reaction, getting the most from the least. Today, they're going around the block to cross the street. They, they think it, lo it looks good. Yeah, it's pretty that you did this, you leapfrogged, you did that, you did this. But we always, we, you, you still wound up in a reverse chin lock. You know what I mean? Why do all that to get to this? People remember only where you got. That is true. And as far as your feud with Terry Taylor, you guys wrestled a lot. He's not one of the most well-liked people by a lot of wrestlers. Why do you think that is? And how was your relationship with him? I mean, Terry was a nice guy and everything, but he, if he was going over, he was in a good mood. If he was going to do a job, he was in a bad mood. The first week that I worked with Terry Taylor, I remember my, my pay jumped to like uh, 7,200 in one week. And and uh, I told my wife, I said, now we're going to buy our first house. Terry Taylor said, I'm going to buy a Volvo. I mean, our priorities were in completely different places. You know, Terry Taylor, he hated the gimmick. I think it was a rib, to be honest with you. I mean, come on. Dressed as a rooster. But what happened in WrestleMania five, I already wrestled Terry for a year. And then I re we we actually redid the angle with Bobby Heenan. Then I got another nine months out of Terry Taylor. So we were making we were making all that money. So after that, I was still going over, still going over. Then they would job me out. They were still jobbing me out as Brooklyn Brawler, Brooklyn Brawler. Bobby would stop coming coming in with me. But still, I was a reliable guy that they could call to do anything. I remember seeing you on an independent show around here in Canada, around 96 against Jimmy Snuka. Did WWE allow you to do indies on the side? And how did you like working with Snuka? And what do you think about all those accusations that he had related to that uh, alleged murder? I think it's, uh, I think it was terrible because it was already closed the case. And I, I heard that, Somebody wrote a book, or even his ex-wife or whatever, and they, they took the body out of the ground and they said there was scars that did not pertain to what the story said and this and that. But in the meantime, uh, Snooker was getting Alzheimer's. You know, he was losing his memory. He couldn't do, couldn't do this, but he was, he was under investigation for murder. But uh, he died way before anything happened. But I, I think it was a complete accident complete accident i think they had a fight he might have slapped her or something she fell she hit her head on the on the uh, nightstand she died cops come they cuff jimmy snooker jimmy snooker breaks the cuffs that's unheard of they had the dogs there the dog bit the cop 
I mean, it's like you can't write this shit. You just can't write this shit. But Jimmy Snooker, they, they Vince sent him away. He disappeared for a long time because the girl, the girl had uh, family relatives that wanted revenge on Snooker and this and that and this and that. I remember her, Nancy, and uh, he was always good to her. He, they, they were they didn't have a, a relationship that they would fight all the time. They they were they were legitimate, legitimately boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, and. Uh, Jimmy was a great guy. I don't have a bad word to say about Jimmy. I traveled with him. I shared rooms with him for about two years. About two years I shared rooms with him. And he was like, uh, he was funny. Brother, I'm a Mormon. Don't, don't smoke no dope in front of me. Don't do this in front of me. Don't do that in front of me. Don't do this. But if you do it, keep the windows closed. <laughs> Is that a contradiction or what? He said he wants to contact you. But uh, not a bad word to say about him. Did you ever wrestle Andre the Giant? Oh, my God. I brought Andre the Giant to my mother's house. I'm in a battle royal. Andre the Giant is in the battle royal. You got no room. You know how it is in a battle royal. You do a little cramp. He gives me a short throw to the ropes. Gives me a big foot. He splashes me. He's on top of me. I'm already claustrophobic. I said, holy shit. And then all the wrestlers jumped on top of, of Andre the Giant. And so I got like five wrestlers on top of Andre the Giant. I'm on the bottom. Andre's got his elbows on, on the mat. He whispers in my ear, I got you, boss. He protected me. I would have been crushed. I would have been killed. Just with Andre, I would have been. Did he treat you well behind the scenes? Because I always heard he either liked you or he didn't like you. It's true. If he didn't like you, don't even go up to him and say hello. He liked me. He asked me to travel with him a little bit. I mean, t uh, Tim White traveled mostly with him, but I traveled with him for about two or three weeks. So I called up my mother. I said, Mom, I'm going to bring a wrestler by the house. She goes, who? I go, oh, some guy. You don't even know what it is. You know? So she lives in a second-story house. He's out there on the top window. So I get out of the driver's seat. <clears throat> and I say, hey, hi. Andre gets out of the passenger seat. All I hear is, oh, my God. You know, the whole block freaked out because he was so over back then. You know, because he was like be more over than Hulk Hogan. I don't even think Hulk was there yet. Because I was there the first day Hulk Hogan came in, too. Who Hulk Hogan asked Vince McMahon, if Steve Lombardi could travel with me everywhere, so I traveled with Hulk for two years. How how was Hulk? Hulk was a good guy, but <clears throat> he's telling me stuff like, you know, brother, go to the Cadillac dealer. Tell him you're a big-time wrestler now. Tell him to give you the biggest, baddest Cadillac there is. You know, now I'm 26, 27, whatever it is, and I'm doing it. I'm buying Cadillacs now. And, and he's telling me, do this, do that, do this, do that. But he didn't tell me about a little thing called taxes. So at the end of the year, I owed $50,000 to the, to the government, which I paid off. But the, the advice was like way out there because he, he was making humongous money, humongous money. I mean, don't tell, don't tell Linda, I, his first wife, don't tell Linda, I told you this, but I just made $83,000 for the quarter for my shirt. It's like insane. It was insane. Back then, it was insane money. But he had me on like a $500 a day guarantee. Is it true that uh, like he was quite a partier at one point in time uh, during his peak? I think I think the whole company pretty much, there was no drug test. It was, per, it was privately owned. It wasn't publicly traded like it is today. And, uh, you know, everybody did did everything in moderation and you know, I don't want to name the, name the drugs and all that shit, but, uh, it, but it was controllable. It was controllable. It wasn't affecting business. Very interesting. But I imagine you stayed out of that because you were also a behind the scenes guy and so forth. You, can, you can't do that and then produce people and do interviews and do DVDs and do, and, and do international interviews and stuff I did. You know what a cold open is? No, I don't actually. Like a cold open is like before the pay-per-view where they show the whole buildup to the pay-per-view 
and all and all the things that happened. This guy beat the hell out of this guy. This guy did this. This guy did that. Yeah. And they would always get. They would always come to me and say, "Get these shots." One time they asked me to get a shot with all the wrestlers together in a V, all standing like that. And, and I had asked Taker. I had asked Sean. I had asked everybody. I, it took me hours to do. My audio guy fucked up, and there was no audio. So now I got to do it twice. I do it again. So every time somebody's seen a pay-per-view in the beginning, I did all those bites. And then they said, they sent it to, I sent it to the office. Then they edit, they put it together. Then they did the cold open. I did all the work, but they did it. Very interesting. How did the, how did you end up getting that job behind the scenes? Just at some point they offered it to you. Michael Hayes was doing it and Michael Hayes was frustrated. He didn't want to be there, but I had such a good rapport with all the wrestlers. I could get the guys in the room. So he goes, Oh my God, I can never get Taker in here. I can never get this guy in here. I said, just, just stay here and watch. And then I've been walking in with Taker. I've been walking in with this one. And then before you know it, he faded himself out and kind of put me into the got He didn't put me in there. I fell into it because he left and I was the guy getting all the guys. And then as I was, as I was in there, I was learning all the bullshit. My, my biggest problem was computers and all this. Shit. I hate, I hate computers because you have to do a lot more than just say, sit down and ask them questions. You got to put, you got to put it all on the computer. They got to send it to the truck. But, but back then you would bring tapes to the truck. Then they had these new things where they, you just put the, uh, what do you call those things you put beside in the computer, those little. Uh, uh, I don't even know. <laughs> you, you're not a computer person not either. DVDs, uh, I don't know. No, yeah, not I know DVDs, you're talking about the little the, rectangle uh, things, right? Where, 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 where it stores all the information. Yeah, the, uh, Dri the, little drives or something. Yeah, yeah, one of those. Then it would go to that. So I just bring this one little thing to the truck, get it done. But they would email me so much work that it was insane. And and then we, we had people in the company that were they're no longer there now because it got revealed that would okay it. It had to go through them, but then they would go to Vince and say, I'm bothering the wrestlers. So now I'm not getting my job done. And I say and I, I, I'm in the room with the guy and I say, I'm not gonna say the guy's name, but he, he I say, Why do you always lie to Hunter? He goes, because this is this is a stupid statement, but he said this privately in a room. He said, when you lie, no one can prove you're lying. I says, what if he heard you say that it's just right now? He says, I would lie. That's what he said to me. But if I said it to Hunter, he, he would say, it's bullshit. I never said that. But if they found out later, he's a liar. And he got fired. Any memories of The Undertaker? Undertaker, uh, when Undertaker first came in, I was in transition between uh, Brooklyn Brawler and Abe Knuckleball Schwartz. So I seen him on TV with Bruce Pritchard. He was he was a manager at first. But Taker was the nicest guy, the most low-key guy. And uh, that's why you got to watch Young Rock. You got to watch you got to watch the series from one one from the first episode. Uh, uh, series to the second it tells you everything it tells you how a taker was in the back in the dressing room it tells you how uh stone cold was in the dressing room it shows you how triple h was in the dressing room and it's all realistic it's really the way they were they they looked at when rock first came in i thought he was like a jock because he, he came from the canadian football and then he got hurt and he came in and i said oh here's another one another football player you know he looked good he had a big, big body and this and that. And the uh, the other wrestlers, they get jealousy. They, 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 like, in other words, they don't want him to make it. So in our episode, which we did, I, I, I we, did, we did the spots, made him look good, boom, 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 got heat on him, got a reverse headlock. He goes, and, and he actually, they, they, they exposed the business. He says to me, what do we do now? I say, you sit here and you convince them 
and make them give a fuck. So I saw cranking his fucking head, cranking his head, cranking his head, cranking his head. He puts his hand up. He starts putting it up. Now all of a sudden, first of all, when he when he walk out, they were yelling, "Who the hell are you? Go back to go back to Florida. We don't know you. Get out of here." He hated that. So they're coming up now. He's, he's putting his arm up. They come up. They're clapping. They're clapping. They're clapping. And then they show in the, in the dressing room. They show Hunter. Look at Stone Cold. And Stone Cold's like, like that. You know, like they're like, holy shit. And then Rock is commentating the whole thing. And uh, he said, to have your first match in WWF is one thing. to be, But to get a baby face reaction is unheard of. And to go over. So when I got back to the, to the dressing room, I said, Rock, that was unbelievable. He goes, you think so? I goes, why? Because they gave a fuck about you. He goes, oh, my God, I'll never forget this. That's what he told me. And uh, it, it, I'm telling you, it's like it was like magic. It, was, it wasn't supposed to happen that way. They were supposed to boom to death. But I turned him into a baby face. Were you around for any backstage fights in WWE? Yeah, I was around for the uh, Shawn Michaels Bret Hart fight. I was there. I'm the one of the one of the Avengers officers said uh, Bret Hart and uh, Shawn Michaels are fighting in, in the uh, shower. But if you want to call it a fight, they both had long hair and they both had each other's hair and they couldn't move because they were holding each other's hair. You know what I mean? But they, they, they didn't like each other. They just, and, and if you ask Brett, he would tell you the reason is that uh, I told him that I would drop the, the belt to you in Montreal and I wouldn't do that for many people. He says, Sean Michael turned to me and says, that's more than I would ever do for you. He says, when he said that to me, he said, I said, fuck this, I ain't doing it. He told Vince, I will not drop the belt. And you could ask Brett this, and he will tell you this. I, I, I will not drop drop the belt to Shawn Michaels, but I will drop it to the Book of Baller. Yeah, I actually heard that uh, from several people that was true. Jared would like to know if you have any Mr. Fuji rib stories. Oh, my God. Do you remember Bobby Jaggers? Yeah, Hangman Bobby Jaggers. He's dead. Okay, when he, when he came in, Mr. Fuji thought that, that it, might, it would be really funny. There was a can of black paint. He went outside and he painted his whole front windshield black. He would stick little uh, toothpicks in, in where the key went because we didn't have those electric, uh, you know, where you just hit, it, hit the button, open, it, open the door. It didn't happen back then. You had to put the key in the hole. But uh, Fuji was a ribber like you wouldn't believe. Like you wouldn't believe. What did you think about Mike Sharp, uh, another enhancement guy that uh, supposedly had some uh, bizarre habits? Well, Mike Sharp was the type of guy that would be the last one in the dressing room. He's a, he put, he put deodorant under his arms. He would wipe it off. He'd put it on again. He'd wipe it off. He'd put it on over and over and over and over. He was... Very loud. <clears throat> I, I wrestled him probably a hundred times. One time in the Philadelphia Spectrum, which is no longer there, I wrestled him. We locked up. We headbutted by accident, and he he got cut open and he juiced, total juice all over his face. I said to myself, "This is great. They're gonna make it sound like I did, I did this to uh, Mike Sharp." I, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. and, and they didn't do that. They pretend somebody else did it. You know what I mean? They didn't want, they didn't, they couldn't push me. They didn't want to push me. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's interesting. Michael wants to know were you insulted when they made you Stone Cold's designated partner for a 1998 pay per view and how was working with Steve Austin? Shit, I was, I was honest. I, I respect the hell out of Steve Austin. Who would be insulted to be in a vignette with Steve Austin? To walk up to him and say, make me your partner, make you me your partner. Beats the shit out of me, throws me into a cage, puts the boots to me, then turns around and Harvey Whipperman and he goes, you're going to be my partner. You know what I mean? Shit. I'm in a vignette with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Oh, that insulted the shit out of me. You know, Give me, why would I be insulted? I was honored. What was your favorite uh, time period to work for WWE? Was it the 80s boom period, Attitude Era? Uh, I, loved the Attitude Era. 
I love the Attitude Era. I, I loved it when it was Vince running the, running the whole deal, and uh, and he, whatever he said went, and uh, and when it was, the business started evolving, where he was stepping back and giving more to Hunter and all. No, when we went corporate, I should say, that's when it all changed. But there was the wars going on. The wars were going on then. That's when they came with the Attitude Era, because. Because Ted Turner couldn't do that on his uh, Turner network because they didn't want that. It was a clean network, but we were getting racy. We were getting racy. Remember Katie Vick? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Could you imagine doing that today? They also had uh, what, uh, John Bobbitt on at one point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Lolly gave it to him. He had all those one liners, all the one liners. He he was saying to him, what did they? What do they feel like to get you? Do you get your thing cut off? He goes. I mean, he was asking him questions like that, and he was, you know, you know he's on commentation. And he's doing one line is and and I don't even. It's just, did WCW ever make you an offer? By the way, did who WCW during that period? Did they ever make you an offer to jump? No. No, I wouldn't have jumped. I was loyal to Vince. Did you have a favorite match or favorite opponent? My favorite opponent ever would have to be Shawn Michaels in Madison Square Garden. I got to say, Rock is up there because I had his first match. But then I wrestled him two or three other times in the Garden. So those were favorite matches. Winning a battle royal at Madison Square Garden was a favorite. Uh, I got I got like 20 favorites. My, my whole career is a favorite. Any memories of wrestling superstar Billy Graham? I think you wrestled oh, him once just yeah. after his hip gave out or something, if I remember correctly. When he got into that karate gimmick, remember when he did the karate gimmick? Yes. He, he, yeah. I'm saying that's when I was saying I used to look at him in a magazine, not knowing I was going to wrestle him at the end of his career. Do you think he could have been like the Hulk Hogan if they had given him that push as a baby face? Uh, rather than switching back lane to champion at that time? Look-wise, yes. Talking-wise, no. Hogan Hogan came up with the gimmick because of superstar Billy Graham, because he liked the, the big muscles and all that kind of stuff. But uh, Hogan had to get the gab. You know, he could, he, he could talk. Someone wants to know what's your opinion on Chuck Austin, the guy that the Rockers accidentally paralyzed that supposedly wasn't very well trained and probably shouldn't have been in the ring. I think that that's that's a good that's a good analogy. He wasn't wasn't trained properly. I think I think it was the, the move where they put the leg behind his head and, and they fall down and something like that. I remember the episode. I wasn't there, but I heard about it and I would say I I, I wrestle the Rockers hundreds of times and I never got crippled and I never got paralyzed. You know, you just got to be careful. Takes two to tango. Did you ever wrestle Haku or or see him in action at all in any of his uh, escapades outside the ring? I mean, well, I wrestled Haku in Japan. It was me and Rick Martel, Haku, and another uh, Japanese wrestler. Haku, Haku was a great guy. He's so polite. He's a nice guy. He says to me, uh, we start the match. He goes, you lock up, chop me in the chest hard, stiff, and I chop you one time, you take bump. I chopped him in the chest twice. He chopped me in the temple and knocked me out. So I'm, I'm knocked out in the egg dome in, in Tokyo. And I feel, did you ever get knocked out? No, but I've been rocked and seen stars lots of times. I've been knocked out. A couple of times and when you get knocked out you feel like you're knocked out for an hour but it's only like a matter of like 20 seconds there's a lot of fans yeah i under actually i have been briefly knocked out by the i was knocked out in rugby and like i was woken up when i hit the ground and i felt like i was waking up from a sleep yeah it, it feels like it's a long time but it's really a short time Lots of questions on here. Do you think they're ever going to put you in the Hall of Fame? That's not my decision. It won't break my heart if they don't. I'd be humbled if they do. 
And could you talk a bit about your relationship with Harvey Whippleman, who uh, you've been close friends with? And I recently interviewed him, and he was saying that he, you and him were like best buddies in the business. We're still best buddies, and he, uh, I traveled with him for over 20 years. And we got so many stories, it's insane. I mean, they, they would have me and Harvey, you know, travel with different people. One time, the one giant El Gigante, I think his name was. Yeah, Giant Gonzalez. Giant Gonzalez. Oh, it was so funny. One time, one time, me and Harvey would get a van. We take the middle seat out. We'd get a we get a cooler of beer in the back. We'd sit in the back and we'd uh, we drink beer while the giant we'd feed coffee to. We just keep, keep stop and get him coffee, coffee, coffee. And he was driving like eighty miles an hour. And now there's a cop car behind us with the lights on. We say, uh, "Giant." cop behind us he goes i know stop I, and he kept going and then there was two cop cars and i said pull over pull over so then I, I opened the side window in the back and i says i said uh don't be alarmed he's a giant they said they said uh is he violent I, we said no so he said boss be calm calm i don't understand i do nothing wrong he gets out of the car the guy the guy was tall i think he was taller than andre they could they want to look in his eyes he had to get down on his knees so me and harvey are saying what if vince passes by in his limo right now and sees the giant on his knees with the cops looking in his ears with me and bruno in the back i mean what would his impression be of that of that visual how did you get along with Vince overall? overall I imagine he liked you. He, well, he kept me around for 32 years. He, he always used to say, if I told Lombardi to go up on the top of that building and bring down a flag, he would bring me down too. He would say stuff like that. You know, he'd always put me over like in statements like that. You know why he was put over, Hannibal? What, the, what are you hanging around with this guy for? This man is reliable. This man is consistent. This man does what he said he's going to do. Last night, we had something set up for you, and last minute, you try to change it around on us? That's not how it works, Daddy. You're lucky that the captain and the brawler... You know, Drew Rags went out of style 20 years ago, right? Really? So, so did crackhead hoodies, Hannibal. I'll see you later. What?